there is no other issue. This is a light and dark issue. is with the support of the Almighty God. So now you know why we can't fix a de facto corporation that has no lawful authority to do what it has done and one that simply mocks our God. So with that, I'm going to yield the floor for comments from the other hosts on tonight's call. Gentlemen? Uh, hi, Kelby, it's Ken. Ken, you have the floor. Okay. Well, that was an extraordinarily comprehensive and concise uh, presentation of the core of the matter of the historical basis of what this is all about. Um, we could go backwards in time to identify key building blocks of that. We could go forward in time. Uh, I'm going to do that just real briefly and succinctly. One of the key things when we talk about Washington, D.C. is its relationships uh, politically, uh, financially, economically, and the bonds that have been established over hundreds and really thousands of years. Real briefly, there's a, a seminal year of 1213, going back into the um, uh, early years of the, um, the formation of the uh, what's what has become known in history as the city of london uh in actual fact we have to go to the year 1066 william the conqueror he established that uh that area on the thames river to be known as london uh interestingly i was talking with a friend of mine that i hadn't seen for a while last night and he was mentioning he was talking to a very learned gentleman in history and law uh, recently and talking about the fact that everything that we're dealing with today in terms of the structure of mortgages, uh, pledges of uh, uh, oaths and fealty, the, the entire underlying commercial uh, functionality of how America has been bled dry over the last 200 years of its, of its wealth, and we are now literally being dispossessed from all of our homes or virtually all of them that the fundamental underlying legal structural principles were actually laid down soon after the conquering of that area of southern uh, England in 1066. The, uh, the crown of England, of course, was held by the sovereigns. It was passed on by lines of succession. And in the year 1213, there was a king known as King John. King John was in fear of his mortal soul, and he wished to make amends, and it, as per the, uh, the nature of the times, for hundreds of years, the Catholic Church was accepting payments from the wealthy in one form or another to basically pay off their sins, obeisances and allowances and things like that. Well, King John, feeling that he had a large and very disproportionate uh, uh, debt to pay, decided to relinquish and grant irrevocably and uncontestably all of his rights, titles, lands, and hereditaments, his and his successors forever, uh, the claim and right to the, to the uh, crown of England. And he granted that, of course, to the Pope and to the Vatican. So to this day, the crown of England is actually held and retained by the Vatican and by the Pope. That was in the year 12, uh, 1213. From that time forward, progressively into the 1600s, culminating with the building of the formal organized uh, uh, jurisdictional area known as the City of London in approximately the, 12, uh, the 1660s. Uh, in fact, if you recall the history of the Great Fire of London, or if you don't recall that, if you don't know about that, do an uh, internet Google search, and you'll find the history of a great fire that swept through these, uh, this area that was specifically desired to be erected to be the City of London. The City of London is a separate, distinct jurisdiction. It has nothing to do with London, England, just as the Vatican City has nothing to do with Rome, Italy, just as Washington, D.C. has nothing to do with the rest of the contiguous states or the Union of States in North America. So 
What I'm outlining here very briefly is the establishment of three of a tripartite three-state independent city-state nations called the Vatican City, the City of London, and Washington, D.C. Because the City of London was established to be the banking center of the world to control the banking wealth and the gold and the commercial uh, extensions of the crown, the crown being held by the, by, uh, the City of London as agent uh, for its owner, the Vatican. Uh, the extension of the City of London for commercial terms was the establishment by corporate charter of something called the British East Indies Company in the early part of the 1600s. And the extending out of the British Empire from the 1600s into the 1900s throughout the world and establishing that at one time virtually 25% or more of the known land and political entities of the world was controlled by the British East Indies Company as a corporate monopoly charter as a commercial extension of the Crown of England for the purposes that I'm outlining. The, when the Constitution for the United States was established, that Constitution established a relationship of a social economic compact between the sovereign nations, the nation states of the republics, the 13 original uh, republics in 1776 through 1787. The commercial interests of the crown were retained in that contract. You can look at Article 6 where it says, henceforward, all debts and engagements previously valid against the Confederation shall henceforward be valid against the United States. That meant the Crown of England through the British East Indies Company as a commercial extension representing both the commercial and economic interests of the city and the owner of the Crown were established as a link to the United States. And the history that Kelby just went through very succinctly is the culminating point approximately 80 to 90 years after that, uh, after the declaration and the establishment of the Constitution in which the corporation was created to turn all of the sovereign capacity and authority of the, the people and the sovereign republics inside out and upside down to create a federal overlay so that eventually, by 1933, all of the states' rights and all of the people's uh, capacities, both as sovereign and in economic and legal terms, would be subrogated and subjugated by contract into that United States. So if you look at the Vatican City, the City of London, and Washington, D.C. as the equivalent of those three points of that uh, configuration that Kelby uh, described, laid out in the map or the street map of Washington, D.C., it's the equivalent. Those are the, it's, uh, it's a concept of a tripartite co-ownership of the world. And in law, we have a, a hierarchy of what is considered the highest laws uh, or forms of law, at least in their point of view. The highest is canon law, that's the church. Below that is kingdom law, that's the crown. And below that is commercial law, and that's the, uh, Washington, D.C., through commerce and through um, the attachment by contract of everything I've described. Now, of course, we could go on and on, but I just want to summarize this, that if we move forward in history from the 1860s and 1870s, that corporation was put into bankruptcy on March 6, 1933. Three days later, FDR declared a state of emergency. He asked Congress to grant him the war powers, the continuation of what Kelby described from the 1860s, basically of martial law. So that from that point forward, we have been in a continual state of declared emergency and declared martial law. And in that state, the president is a dictatorial authority who controls the structure that we thought or we were taught in school was a separation of, of uh, power, balance of power between three, uh, three um, uh, branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. 
where in fact those three branches are under the authority of the president. Everything we watch unfold these days is more, uh, uh, for the most part, a dog and pony show to keep the public thinking we have some form of say in the government, and we do not. In 1933, when all this happened, everything was brought under that corporate United States and attached as pledge collateral. And from that point forward, everything is a collateralized, what's known in insurance and in legal terms, as a pledge of, of surety, a guarantee. Against what? Against debt. And the system we have today is an ever-expanding, uncollectible, and unretirable uh, structure of debt that basically is designed and has been designed from all of this time, all the shifts we were covering, to bond the people through that surety attachment to a status of perpetual debt enslavement. That's you who are listening to the call. It's your children, it's your grandchildren, and it's your great-grandchildren. Except for one caveat. You know, I said there's a hierarchy of those laws. What supersedes that is the law of the land, the people's law that we have re-invoked and re-inhabited through re-inhabiting the republic, and we hold the law of the land, and the law of the land supersedes all of that, and we have the capacity and we do have the authority. We're not going to go into the context tonight about that, but if you're interested, go back to the archives on our website, which is Republic for the United States. Dot org and find over on the on the right side the archives of these Wednesday night calls and over the last several months we've systematically built a, a history and a context for you to be educated about many of these things to understand the economics of it the, the legal aspects of it and the history and so I'm going to leave you with one more historical context uh, from 1933 on, what has been built has been what many people call and refer to and understand as the New World Order and the subjugation of the sovereignty of the United States into a global system. I'm just going to read you about four or five uh, statute quotes from the United States Code and related uh, bodies of codified uh, statutes. Starting with, on December 26, 1933, 49 statute, that's referring to the statutes at large of the United States, 49 statutes, 3097, Treaty Series 881, Convention on Rights and Duties of States, wherein it states that Congress replaced statutes with international law, placing all states under international law vis-a-vis -vis the Uniform Commercial Code. On December 9, 1945, the International Organization Communities Act relinquished every public office of the United States to the United Nations. 22 CFR, which stands for uh, Code of Federal Regulations, which is basically the implementa implementing regulations uh, that come out of the Federal Register, 22 CFR 92.12 through 92.31, heading, quote, foreign relationship, states that an oath is required to take office. At Title VIII, United States Code 1481, it states, once an oath of office is taken, citizenship is relinquished. Thus, one becomes a foreign entity or agency or state. That means that every public office in the United States has been pledged to be in the United Nations and is acting as a public office or officer as a foreign state, including all po political subdivisions, and every public officer is a foreign agent, including every court in this system is considered a separate foreign entity. All the courts are administrative courts functioning within an admiralty international law adjudicating the ongoing bankruptcy of the United States Corporation and settling the commercial requirements under that context with all the people being the bonded surety. In other words, we're hamsters on a wheel continually 
creating more debt, more attachment, and perpetuating.